So this is just the uh, uh, final kind of small third of the presentations which I'm uh, uh, giving you today, and then we'll have a, a final and different uh, speaker. Um, but we made sure he was also called David because that's, <laughs> that's one of the conditions here. So uh, This is session three, according, bringing peace and reconciliation. Of course, you know, I'm well aware there's a, a huge kind of, and growing uh, body and expertise about this kind of area. You can do degrees in, uh, in this at university and you can uh, be well trained in the kind of techniques and the ways of doing this. And we rely on those uh, people and hope that more people come forward with uh, even better and greater skills. Um, but I, I, I'm not really approaching that traditional area, but more here to give certain kind of little insights which uh, explain you know, why UPF is doing the work that it's doing and what, uh, what unique contributions that can make. So, um, I'll use some quotations from other sources as well. So I think these are very much general interest. You know, where does peace begin? This is the UNESCO Constitution preamble. It says, since wars begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. So the kind of idea is already there. And we've been kind of giving quite a lot of credence to the uh, religious uh, contribution as a, a necessary restorative vehicle, if you like. Here's Father Moon speaking in 1990. He said, why? Throughout history, have people needed to improve themselves through morals, ethics, and religion? Why should we observe them? It's because we sense something is wrong with us, and we desire to return to our original standing before God. However hard the original mind may struggle to attain goodness, we can hardly find any examples of true goodness in this world under the sovereignty of evil. Human beings have thus been compelled to seek the source of goodness in the world transcendent of time and space. This necessity has given birth to religion, and through religion, fallen people mired in ignorance have sought to meet God by ceaselessly striving toward the good. Uh, this is a quotation from the kind of original textbook called Exposition of the Divine Principle. So how do we set about, you know, changing our nature for the better? We use a term here, um, and Father Moon called it the kind of law of indemnity. It's a, it's a word that's borrowed from the, maybe the legal realm. But indemnity means paying a certain uh, price to restore something that was lost, making some, largely, it's, they, these tend to be... Um, symbolic conditions, or what we call conditions of uh, lesser indemnity. They have to be voluntarily done, things that we do uh, of our own free will to make effort to put something right and to re realize the mistake that we might have made. So if um, any original position or state, it even could be your health, you know, if that's lost, you have to look at the current reality, see what is wrong, how that came about, and work to restore it. So it needs some effort to reverse or restore whatever was lost. So if through um, stupidly lying to a friend, you lose their friendship right? and you regret what you've done, there are ways to come back, obviously, but you have to allow a certain amount of time to pass, maybe. You have to show your sincerity. You have to approach that person with a very genuine heart and say, you know, what I did was wrong, I'm really sorry, I hope you can forgive me. And, you know, if they feel they have the grace to do that at that time, uh, they, can, they can do that. Right? So the, there are processes which we could, you know, if time allowed, we could talk about these. But uh, taking responsibility uh, by taking actions to correct weaknesses, misconduct, or bad habits. This is, uh, 
involving this principle of indemnifying mistakes or indemnifying some problem. And we set it in the context of what is called restoration, putting things uh, right or back to how they should have developed or been in the beginning. So restoration occurs when you find yourself in a similar position to where mistakes were made in the past. Okay, you were um, involved or witnessing some mistake in the past, then you need to, uh, maybe that situation is recreated and you have like another opportunity to put right what previously went wrong. So to restore something, you have to maybe face the same temptation to make the same mistake, right? Um, and if you do make the same mistake, you're continuing a destructive pattern and it's unhelpful. So we have to uh, be aware of that and, um, uh, and make those changes. So if an honest person, a, you know, previously honest person uh, lies, they're maybe labeled in the person they have offended in their eyes as a liar. They're now this kind of liar. I don't want to deal with this person. But we need to have a change of heart. We need to confess. We need a period of honest conduct, which shows that we're serious about what we mean. And hopefully through that we can recover our lost status as an honest person in the eyes of others. So there are these processes. It's interesting that um, at their root, you know, uh, religion, where religion is uh, uh, good, it's teaching these kind of processes and encouraging uh, the forgiveness that goes along with this. Um, but if you choose not to do that, and instead of acting out of your uh, fallen nature, you act according to your original nature and your original mind, so you are following your conscience, this is, you know, exercising some kind of restoration. And in doing so, of course, you break the cycle of abuse and the pattern of fallen history. Now, these patterns kind of, by looking at Old Testament and other uh, religious sources, Father Moon kind of really extracted the kind of essence of how to undergo this process of restoration, see where it was going on, where opportunities were perhaps presented but not made use of, and where they were converted into some valuable restorative action. So it's in a way looking at those traditions and gleaning from them this uh, particular kind of uh, tool, if you like. So until restoration on a particular level is accomplished, then same problems will occur. So we need to reconcile with God and with higher values. The religious life is encouraging people to do this. It doesn't mean everybody follows that. Eh? As we say, there are a lot of uh, abuses in religion. But in its essence, it's providing this way. Uh, study of scripture, you know, seeking insight, Prayer, meditation, this is all self-reflection and trying to look inside myself more honestly, awakening and stimulating the conscience and leading to some uh, point of confession. That's why often you find the religious leader or whether it's a guru or a, you know, a priest or, or whatever it is, is, is important in one's life because it's, that's the person that you can come to to feel that your uh, confession or your honesty is being listened to by a higher power and it's also enabling you to get free of the kind of selfish uh, desire to have those behaviors we talked about before, the kind of lying or hiding or, you know, uh, trying to put on a, a face like um, you know, everything is good when actually it's not or this kind of thing. Are you with me? Everybody okay? So, uh, you know, therefore we see kind of these patterns of going a reverse way or a restorative way in religion. And you find for traditions that encourage people to go the way of a, uh, a monk or a nun, for example, and that's quite a few traditions actually. I mean, it's um, in, uh, you get Anglican monks and nuns, you get Catholic, monks and nuns, obviously, and Buddhist monks and nuns. You get this kind of celibacy and Hinduism and the kind of uh, um, call to that, choice of a person to go that route. And these three uh, vows form the kind of monastic tradition that is uh, 
um, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Right? Those actually are very related to the, uh, those three blessings or three foundations of peace that we talked about earlier. It's a way to restore that. Obedience is like you know, putting my mind and body in the right relationship right, in front of God. Uh, chastity is denying myself that kind of married relationship and sexual relationship because it's almost saying, well, I have to sort myself out first, you know, before I engage in that. And for some people that might constitute a lifetime. It's a great sacrifice, right? And people who've made that sacrifice and paid that indemnity, to use the language of the principle, uh, then there are people who... Um, you know, maybe they would have made the best mothers and fathers, actually, you know, but they felt called to do that. And maybe, maybe knowing why to satisfy themselves, but not knowing this kind of deeper part of restoring the way that love has been misused, as we talked about. So those people of good faith and good conscience found themselves going a path of celibacy, which, of course, it's not a universal panacea, is it, right? I mean, if everybody did that as their response to God's calling, then humanity would die out. So, I mean, I'm thinking very practically here. <laughs> but still, you know, people, that's their response to their conscience. And poverty is also the kind of monk's way. You know how the traditional uh, uh, Thai Buddhist monk just possesses four things, I think. They have two orange robes. They wash one and wear the other, and then they swap over, right? And then they have a bowl, a silver bowl, which they can, as they pass through a village, people will come and put rice in. That's people making their little indemnity offering, a little bit of, you know, support. Uh, and they'll have a, a kind of mesh or strainer to take out uh, the flies and not to, you know, four things. No iPad, iPhone, iPod, i anything, right? You know, so it's a choice though, isn't it, right? And actually probably you feel very free. Wow, I don't have those things to worry about. Right? So uh, maybe a good, good thing to do for a certain period of one's life anyway. So this is reversing, it's going the opposite way um, to, to that third blessing because we couldn't handle it responsibly. It's like making a condition to come back to a point again where God can say, okay, now, you know, you don't have to be poor anymore. You don't have to be unmarried anymore. You, you know, are you with me? But of course, these things don't happen in just a person's lifetime. It's a whole historical process that humankind is being led through. And this, the unification principle reveals through its analysis of history. It's very, very fascinating. <laughs> So when we honor God and higher values and we really love each other, this is the kind of um, a good kind of practice and it's going a reverse way to how these problems came about. It's called, uh, in our terminology, making a foundation of faith and then a foundation of substance is actually changing and bettering your character substantially. So we need to do this and we need to do it of our own will and our own effort, right? When Jesus famously, famously said, uh, love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, he was picking out two separate parts of the um, Jewish Torah, right? And uh, in response to the question, what is the most important law? Well, he discerned that, and having read everything, obviously, he said, that's the most important. And that is, you know, the first is restoring your faith uh, because human beings lost their standing as faithful beings in front of God uh, by disobeying the commandment. And then they disturb the kind of horizontal order between each other, and that needs to be restored. So uh, we need success in both of these kind of areas, our inner self-reflection and awakening our conscience and also practice in relationship with others and making good relationships. And we can uh, move towards the goal of peace. So we talked earlier about the kind of uh, origins of our problem based in uh, illicit love. This was very much like the parents' generation problem, if you like, or caused kind of uh, 
people in their um, undeveloped spirituality to marry together and to procreate and pass on that self-centered love down through the generations. So it gets visited on the next generation. And in the biblical source, the next story that comes along is the story of Cain and Abel, the uh, sons of Adam and Eve. And Cain ends up murdering his brother. And that is, makes him the first murderer in history, if you follow that line of history. Right? But in a way, it's a metaphor, and Father Moon uses this as a kind of paradigm for understanding the, the whole kind of history of conflict, which is essentially a conflict between brothers, people who should be able to get on well together, historically has tended to be men more than women, uh, who've done that kind of fighting and resorted to violence. So the Cain-type nature, uh, when faced with difficulty or jealous feelings or angry feelings, resorts to violence. And it's more the younger brother in this story, the Abel, uh, who is more sensitive to uh, um, God's calling and to the kind of response of the faithful person. So really, we could say in this story, which is an archetype of conflict, that God wanted Cain and Abel to really love each other, to solve their differences in that family in a way there was an opportunity to do that. Remember I said, you know, restoration is like a recurring opportunity to do right what in the past was done wrong. So we are given this kind of next opportunity and um, it's beautifully expressed. I, I quote this because it always strikes me like very profound psychology actually. Already here in the fourth book of Genesis, it says God is speaking to Cain, right, who's just had his uh, uh, offering not accepted, although his brother's is accepted, and he feels a lot of jealousy over this. Uh, God says to him, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Right? It's a very loving thing to say, actually, right? No, I'm ready here to embrace you, but you need to do what is right. If you do not do what is right, sin is couching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. In other words, you need to get a grip on these kind of feelings and whatever it is that's making you want to, you know, express your anger or lash out at your brother or feel uh, sorry for yourself. Have all those kind of feelings that resorted in, you know, as we said, in, in lying or attacking the other or, uh, you know, acting violently, this kind of thing. Then, you know, you need to get a grip and get a handle on that. So the important thing about that story is it's being left open, right? Mm. That means it's not an inevitability that he kills his brother. It's more like he's given this loving warning, you know. Surely you will be embraced and accepted if you overcome these feelings. If you overcome those feelings, which incidentally are the kind of feelings which first occurred in the archangel in the story, then you're overcoming that for all history. You're getting it out of your family line, if you like. Are you with me? So that's, that's the importance of it. It means your descendants won't be suffering the same things because you will have solved it for them. So we have this choice to solve it and let me be the solution, or I could multiply the problem and pass it on to somebody else. And in a, inevitably, the problems get passed on land with our children, don't they? So we want to be sure we don't do that. Here is the... Uh, Second United Nations Secretary General, you know, the, the, the very fine man who was tragically killed in an air, air crash, um, uh, Dag Hammarskjöld. He said, I see no hope for permanent world peace. We have tried and failed miserably. Unless the world has a spiritual rebirth, then civilization is doomed. So under this kind of um, paradigm of the kind of Cain-Abel structure that the principle presents. We see that Abel, this younger brother, is loved by God but could not win the heart of his brother who was consumed with resentment right, towards his younger brother. And Abel had God's blessing but maybe he wouldn't share it with his brother. And somewhere this is also indicating that both you know, have good points and bad points. And it's very good to remember when you're in a kind of conflict resolution situation. 
that that's going to be the case. It's not black and white. Uh, Cain was consumed with resentment over perceived injustice. He saw or felt that what was being done to him was unjust, but that's confused with selfish feelings of like, I'm the eldest, I should be treated with respect, I should be, you know, it's a very great tendency. And in a way, the situation he was put in was to exaggerate those feelings, if you like, so that he would be all the more kind of victorious if he overcomes them. And he didn't see his brother from God's point of view. Remember, that was what we call the first aspect of our fallen nature, not loving the other person from God's standpoint. So he was jealous, unable to control his anger, and he murdered his brother. If we twist it around and we kind of say, what if, and this is one of the interesting things that the unification principle allows us to do, and it's a little bit uh, different to traditional doctrines in that way, um, it says, what should happen? Well, Abel should be humble, and being blessed by God should receive that humbly. He should forgive and be tolerant in the face of some kind of abuse, even from his elder brother. And he should serve his brother in order to melt that resentment which his elder brother had. And then he's kind of ready to mediate and can actually maybe help his brother to make a good offering and have it accepted. It takes both sides to cooperate with that, doesn't it, right? Because the elder brother has to get off his high horse and go and ask his younger brother, how, you know, how, how do you recommend I do this? <laughs> Which takes some humility. And his younger brother should not be feeling, well, I'm favored and you're not. Uh, you know, hard luck to you. He should actually be feeling, well, I want to help my elder brother. He's obviously suffering. I want to bring him. So uh, Cain needs to overcome resentment and feelings of rejection. He needs to recognize his brother's value. And he needs to rejoice in his brother's success so he can move on from... Uh, being, uh, feeling these feelings of hatred and be ready to reconcile. So this is a kind of paradigm there, even though historically the story at this stage, you know, it went wrong, the, the problem was multiplied, there are the seeds there or the things we can notice in this story about how it could have gone differently. And this is the kind of step two, it's reconciling with each other. Here in uh, the Holy Quran, it says the repayment of a bad action is one equivalent to it, but whoever pardons and makes reconciliation, his reward lies with God. He does not love the unjust, but whoever endures patiently and forgives, this is a sign of real resolve. In Christianity in Matthew, it says uh, Jesus giving this advice, which I think is actually very much thinking back to that Cain and Abel story, that's my guess. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, uh, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In fact, I would say it's probably his insight there is that in the Cain and Abel story, there were problems between these brothers before it ever came to making an offering, right? So it was like Abel should have sorted that out first of all, right? With his brother and uh, not just gone and made his offering and expect to be uh, accepted. So restoration of the elder son's birthright. This is quite a mouthful, isn't it? But this is the process is going on in restoration in the uh, stories that are based in Holy Scripture. You know, uh, and I'm just going to pick out the story of, I don't know if this is familiar uh, to you, the story of Jacob and Esau. Do you remember this story? Or have you come across it in your tradition, respectively? I, I don't know. There are uh, these two twins born to Rebekah and the father Isaac. Uh, this is the son of uh, uh, Abraham. Okay. So uh, in this story, Rebecca, when she is pregnant, she has these twins that she feels fighting in her womb. Can you imagine women, men? I don't know, but <laughs> less likely we can imagine, but women, you know, and she questioned, she obviously went to pray about this. And the answer she got was, you know, 
uh, two nations are in your womb, and the elder must serve the younger. That's very interesting, isn't it? Right? Because this is like reversing this problem of elder brother, younger brother. You know, they couldn't reconcile at the time of you know, Cain and Abel. But there's another kind of set of now very closely related twins. They're just kind of, one is seconds older than the other, right? But they're still going to be the elder. But mother already knows that the elder must serve the younger, which means kind of come back to God through the younger brother, which is not going to be easy. This is restoration, right? And this is why in the biblical stories, certainly, you know, it's often the younger brother who seems to be favored by God and the elder brother isn't, right? Because there's a tradition in the fallen world, as there should be originally, that the inheritance from the parents is passed on to whom? The elder son, right? Almost every culture practices that, right? Uh, maybe we're more democratic here in the West. We say, you know, it'll go to the children equally or somebody will write that in their will. But traditionally, it's always gone to the elder son, becomes the next center of the family, right? So it was important to the Jews who was, you know, who was that eldest person. And we see uh, there that this, you know, this struggle is kind of being set up, really, between these two whereby the eldest son actually doesn't care so much for his birthright. He, in fact, sells it to his brother for a pottage of lentils and a good hearty meal when he comes back home from hunting. So, you know, it's obviously he's not really so concerned about it. Right? So if you read these stories, they're very human stories. They're very beautifully told. But we're looking kind of inside to see what is going on in terms of restoration. Jacob buys the birthright so he has certain legitimacy there from his elder brother. He says, you know, okay, I'll give you this meal, but you give me your birthright. And he says, okay, you have it. Uh, so it, on some level, he's got it. Um, and he receives with his mother's help uh, the blessing which was due to the eldest son uh, from his blind father, Isaac, by dressing up as, it, as you know, his elder brother. So it's a little dubious, but it was the mother taking full responsibility for this. So... Uh, Isaac went along with it. And then, uh, because of his brother's anger, when he finds out about this, how he's been denied his blessing, uh, then he has to escape because his younger brother, his older brother, is out to kill him, right? Although he has some decency and he says, I won't do it until your father is dead, and then I'll do it, right? <laughs> so, you know, these are the stories. Uh, Jacob has to escape. Also, what if, you know, Father Moon was saying, you know, these things should have been resolved in the family. Actually, they should have been resolved there. But maybe there wasn't really good communication between the parents. After all, Rebecca overheard the father saying, you know, it's time now to give the blessing to the eldest son. She just overheard it. And she said, quickly, I want to get the younger son in there, right? So she makes this kind of whole... Uh, process. So it's an interesting kind of turnaround of events. But, you know, if it had been resolved properly through communication in the family, then what happened wouldn't have had to happen. As it was, uh, Jacob had to leave and he'd go for 21 years to his mother's brother and live there in Haran, a different country. He never saw his parents during that time. He built up his own family and his own wealth, and he was treat, mistreated and cheated 10 times by his uncle, who didn't turn out to be such a nice character. And, um, but also he learned through that that, well, maybe this is how my brother felt when he was cheated out of his uh, blessing. So he learned something, and he still had the mind that for the future generations to come from that lineage, the future nation that was spoke about, that he cared more about than his brother, than he wanted to go back and reconcile with his brother. So there's a wonderful story of reconciliation here that Father Moon takes as a kind of paradigm for, even in his own life, you know, he exercises this kind of uh, process of uh, taking a lower position and a humble position, but really seeking to disarm the uh, opposing elder brother, if you like, and be able to um, uh, reconcile. And he did this, and I'm not sure if uh, uh, 
David in the next talk will, will mention this or have time to do, but uh, there was a time, I think in 1992, when Father Moon went back against the South Korean government um, law into North Korea. It was very hard to get in there, right? He took a party of people in the days before mobile phones, we, uh, and he essentially went there to reconcile with the communist dictator in, the, in North Korea, Kim Il-sung, the person who was ultimately responsible for Father Moon being in a North Korean concentration camp for two years and eight months, where he was sent essentially to die. So this is the person who had tried not only on that occasion, but other occasions to eliminate him. But he said his lifelong ambition was to embrace this person as my brother. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And, um, you know, so, so he's used this kind of, these, these kind of principles in his own life and encouraging others to make peace, such as in the MEPI and the Middle East Peace Initiatives that uh, David Earl talked about in the beginning talk. So here we have Jacob mistreated by his uncle Laban, uh, deciding to come back after 21 years he goes through a kind of all-night struggle. It's described as a fight with an angel. Um, you know, if, if that doesn't fit with you, you could think he's just going through also an internal struggle. You know, how am I going to do this? How can I, you know, disarm my brother in this way, get rid of his bitter and angry feelings? I hear he's coming out to meet me with 400 armed warriors. So he's obviously not over the problem yet, right? And he overcomes this kind of fight with the angel as described. And he sends livestock and servants ahead of him as gifts. He sends his family. They bow. And as he approaches his brother, he bows seven times to the ground, right? He shows such humility. He returns all these kind of things, the result of the blessing he was given, you know, he returns them to his brother, and his brother says, no, I don't need these things, and there's a beautiful kind of argument goes on, right? So uh, how, how is this related to what we talked about before? We could say then in this story, Esau's responsibility there is to go the reverse way to the way that the fallen nature works. And we mentioned four points of fallen nature, right? So he has to love Jacob as God loves Jacob rather than the opposite. Uh, so he has to take God's standpoint in loving his brother. He has to receive love through his brother and accept that love and those gifts. And then he has to serve and follow his brother, recognize that maybe actually he would make a better center of the family than I would, which is quite a difficult thing to do, but it would be the solution to these problems. And then he has to learn God's way through Jacob and multiply goodness rather than uh, end up repeating the crime of Cain killing Abel. So he overcomes, his heart melts, and his brother has a great kind of role in melting his heart. We call it winning the heart of Cain, right? And that is very necessary. So a person on the kind of uh, Abel side has to make those uh, efforts and those conditions and show that kind of integrity. Again, here is Father Moon speaking on this very question. He said, only after the reunion with his brother Esau could Jacob meet his parents, whom he had missed for so many years and enjoy the peace he had longed for. We too can enter God's kingdom and meet God only after we have gone through the course of Jacob and made oneness with the Esau's in our life. For such is the restoration of Cain and Abel. So we have those things even in our own life, I'm sure you might find, if you question deeply, you have an Esau in your life, right? So it's a great example of peacemaking efforts. Jacob, in this able role, has to maintain and grow in faith and endure. And Esau has to let go of those aspects of fallen nature that he's inherited and undergo really a change of heart. So, and then it's amazing in a way how, hap how quickly it happens, right? So that's a kind of important lesson from the story. Uh, we have to be successful Abels like uh, Jacob was. So uh, here on this kind of topic, you have a figure such as Dr. Martin Luther King speaking. He said, we must discover the power of love 
the power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We'll be able to make men better. Love is the only way. And he also said, never get, we never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. That kind of feeling of hatred has to be dissolved in that way. A few more quotes for you, quotations. Is that all right? What is an ideal family, Father Moon says? Some might say, well, it's a family whose members all trust each other. And others might say, it's a family whose members know each other well. And these descriptions fall short. An ideal family is a family whose members are connected with an inseparable bond of heart. It's a family whose members feel each other's pain as their own, or even more deeply than their own pain. Hence, they willingly sacrifice themselves to carry the other's burden. Such a family can be called an ideal family. He said, I'm teaching you to love those who hate you. If you love them, sooner or later they will come to like you. If you return good three times for every time someone does you wrong, eventually that person will bow his head. Try it yourself and see if I'm right or not. You know, everyone has a conscience. As I said earlier, everybody has that kind of see that original mind inside themselves. And this is maybe a clue as to how to penetrate that or how to get it to respond in a person. So, um, uh, again, he says, true love has influence on the enemy. If you overcome the first, second, and fourth difficult situation with love, the enemy will disappear. Jesus loved his enemies knowing that love has such power. And such uh, ideas are... They, you also find them, like in the life of uh, Gandhi. He said, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. It's kind of winning in the end, you might say. Eh? So the greatest act of love is that love for enemy. To give even to those who have done one great harm is the key to peace. It converts the enemy into a friend and reverses kind of ancient patterns of abuse and revenge. So, you know, you need to uh, reawaken the kind of understanding and revert to understanding of how to employ these principles of uh, true love and productive relationships. Our choice then, as I said, is to resolve or repeat past conflicts. Unresolved problems will surely be passed on to future generations and often, because things tend to expand and multiply, might be bigger or more difficult to resolve the more time goes on. A uh, very interesting aspect of the unification principles is the kind of view of history that recognizes that there was a move afoot to bring a great kind of coordinated solution to the roots of conflict through a massive spiritual awakening in various different cultures and nations around the world. In a, what's often called the axial period, it's, it's between 600 up to 400 BCE, before the Common Era or before Christ. It's that, you know, uh, before year zero, it's 600 to 400 years before. And that is where you see a kind of a burgeoning and awakening of spirituality in humankind, a change also in the nature of religion to a much more internal um, understanding of one invisible God and kind of higher ethics and values than were practiced before. You see it with the um, birth and teaching of Confucius, of Lao Tzu in China. You see it with the Buddha in uh, India and Zoroaster in Persia. And you see it uh, in the kind of reforms going on in uh, the oldest religion in Hinduism, in uh, the Upanishads. You see it in Judaism through the uh, Reformation brought about by, by Malachi in the last 400 years before Jesus, reconstituting a nation that can be ready to re receive a kind of uh, a higher level of teaching and reformation. You see it and the principle recognizes 
the kind of great Greek thinkers like Socrates, not normally thought of as religious leaders, but because of their insight and contribution to uh, humanity. Uh, they are up there with these kind of high spiritual figures as Socrates and there, there are other developments around the world as well. It's interesting, isn't it? They're all happening roughly at the same kind of time and independent of one another. So it's an awakening there. The, the profound kind of insight uh, in the expanding this cain Abel paradigm that Father Moon was saying is that you know, as it went through history, seeking to be resolved on necessarily uh, bigger levels from uh, family to society to nation to eventually a worldwide level, there have been Cain and Abel struggles, struggles between brothers, right? Very similar in nature. So we can call it the Cain Abel problem. And the Abel tradition, the Abel type view of life, is that born by Hebraism through Christianity, Islam, these kind of religious traditions. They're responding in uh, piety and in faith. They're not perfect, but they are really the kind of brother that God can work with. Are you with me? Because of those sensibilities and those kind of, uh, the way it's aware of the spiritual reality and the effort to kind of act morally and ethically. Uh, there's another trend, which is the Cain-type trend, which, okay, it was resolved on a family level to some extent with Jacob and Esau, but it still couldn't, uh, the, the kind of evil in the world was much bigger than that one family, so it still had to progress to greater levels. And we see it emerge then at the time when Jesus was born, interestingly, the, the end kind of of this period, 400 years later, we see him coming uh, where there's a developed strand of Cain-type thinking which emerges in Hellenism and the Greek and Roman culture. Particularly the Roman culture was had its thumb or boot firmly on Israel, right, at that time. And then you have the Hebraic culture coming to some fruition at that time. So uh, Hellenism and Hebraism is like Cain and Abel. Are you with me? And they represent more the kind of body or material side and more the kind of spiritual or mind side. But like mind and body, they need to work together. They have something to contribute to each other. But Father Moon's insight is that that opportunity was lost because Jesus was not received as the expected savior, actually. And because of that, these, even these religious traditions kind of continued on their separate ways rather than being brought into some unity that would be world transforming 2,000 years ago. Now that's a big what if, isn't it? Right? But it's really fascinating when you think that a lot was being prepared in these religious traditions for something much greater, not to just carry on as their own individual traditions, each proud of their own you know, histories, and maybe rightly so in some senses, but working separately, they should have come together under a reformed Judaism and Jesus leadership. So uh, that was not the way things turned out. As I said, it was predicated on Jesus being accepted and understood, but these traditions have carried on. It's interesting uh, that this, uh, understanding is picked up by uh, a scholar of religions. Uh, this is Karen Armstrong, if you're familiar with her work. And I like this quotation from her book, The Great Transformation, it's called. She's talking about this period of history from 400 to 600 years uh, before uh, year zero, right? Uh, she says that as far as these sages, that's the people that I've outlined here, right? As far as these sages were concerned, respect for the sacred rights of all human beings was religion. If people behaved with kindness and generosity to their fellows, they could save the world. This was something kind of in the heart of each of these religious traditions. Isn't that interesting? It is to me. And she goes on to say, we need to rediscover this ethos. We must learn to live and behave as though people in countries remote from our own are as important as ourselves. Amen? Amen?
Yay! I agree with that, right? Absolutely. So that's a kind of uh, little bit of history added in at the end. So we kind of touched on some of these ideas. I hope this at least whets your appetite for uh, further study and you know different aspects. You know, as was mentioned before, actually, uh, Mr. Keith Best put it so uh, eloquently, as he always does, right? Oh, uh, he just put it so eloquently. You know, the the movement is tackling many different areas. There's a kind of avenue for each person to work in, you know. And uh, some areas will suit your nature, your abilities, your natural disposition better than others. But, you know, everybody is needed and everybody is valued as part of this peacemaking effort. Uh, so I commend it to you. Thank you very much and God bless you all.